This week's story, which occurred in 1981, is so strange and terrible as to be almost unbelievable. Yet everything you hear and see is based on letters found and statements taken by the police. They will appear in person, as will the forensic scientists who carried out the original investigations. Those taking part in the events leading up to the crime are portrayed by actors, and names of people and places have been changed. Leon Silberman lived in Paris. His wife, Lissa, left him 15 years ago. He was an unhappy man and always felt that he and Lissa had failed miserably in the way they tried to bring up their only child, Joey. Leon used to confide his thoughts in letters to a friend in America. I was always horrified by the way the French bring up their children, always squelching them, putting them in their place. They used to spoil Joey dreadfully. He was a highly intelligent boy, but also deeply disturbed. Joey was a wonderful child, and we mixed him up terribly out of great love. Lissa would always do whatever he wanted. She just could not see that sometimes love can destroy. Breathe in. This time we're bringing the body down and forward. Lissa had gone to live in Israel. She used to visit England for two reasons. The first was to attend a special yoga center which gave relief to her multiple sclerosis. The second reason was Joey. I realize I pour too much emotion towards you. And it's probably not healthy for a grown-up son. And you're right to reject it. Still, you are wrong not to make some contact. Breathe in. Normal love, I hope, mummy. Okay, breathe out. Joey lived in a bungalow which he'd made into a sort of laboratory. Here he did experiments with chicken embryos. At the age of 27, Joey's life was almost empty of human contact. One rare attempt at communication was a letter he wrote to the FBI. My parents are dangerous psychotics and have committed some serious crimes against me. My father was frightened that because he was rich, I would grow up soft unless I learn to be violent. He'd say, a school for you should be like a zoo. It must be violent. And teachers should teach boys to be violent. But I hate violence. Where's your dad? He went out. How long are you planning to spend in Paris?
I'd like you to go now. Joseph, darling. <laughs> Be a good boy. Bring in my bags, eh? No, she isn't. She left. And she went back to London. Who is this, please? Well, she came and she left. She went back to London. Control, can I help you? Yes, we'll hang on a minute. I'll just get the file out. Yes, and the missing person's surname? Silberman. Can you spell? We first became involved when a friend of Mrs. Silberman reported her as a missing person. Christian name? Lisa. We've had a tinkle from a Dr. Patel. He had been trying to contact her at her son's home for a number of days, had been unable to do so, and was concerned about her whereabouts. Is this your mother's suitcase? Yes, that's my mother's suitcase. What conversation did you have with your mother before she left? just said she was going to London. She left in a taxi. That's perfectly normal. There was obviously something drastically wrong. Joey said that his mother had gone off to London, yet her suitcase was still there, her clothes were there, her books were there. We decided to arrest him on suspicion of causing harm to his mother and then get the scenes of crime department to move in and see what they could find in the house. Come on, Joey, get in the back. Sit there, Mike. Come on, your head. That's it. Good. This is obviously all this here. Yes, it's had a fair of the lights for the when the team first moved into the house, we started off looking initially for a whole body. 
Let's clear anyway. Where's the chickens? It can't be far away, there's the feed there. I'll look through the pen. When this proved negative, we made a far more thorough search looking for pieces. Right, we'll have a look in the front room, just a quick look, and then we'll, uh, we'll start again. God, look at this. I've got a lady. Well, I don't know what we'll do for this one. We started looking for the crutches because we assumed that if her crutches were here, then she would be here somewhere. didn't find the crutches either. They were just nowhere to be found. It's all sorts of rubbish here anyway. And some acid. I wonder what wants that for. So we found bottles of acid in one of the rooms and we considered the possibility that the body had in fact been dissolved in acid. Joseph, let's go back to your mother. Now you say she left in a taxi. Yes, she left in a taxi. How did she get the taxi? Did she telephone or what? Yes, she telephoned. Who did she telephone for a taxi? I don't know. She phoned a taxi. That's all I know. Did you see the taxi come? So. You don't think so? Will you try and remember? Did you see the taxi come? No, I, I did not see the taxi come. I was in the garden. Well, Joseph, we've made inquiries of every taxi firm. We can find no one received a call from your mother and we've been unable to find any taxi driver who picked her up. We've made inquiries of all the neighbours. Several of them saw her arrive. None of them seen her leave. How do you account for that? This is not unusual for neighbours to see because they don't they don't always look all the time. Joseph, look at me. Will you look at me? Joseph, look at me. We don't believe your mother left in a taxi at all. It's incredible. It just isn't true, is it? My mother phoned for a taxi and she left. That is perfectly normal. How far have we got then, John? Well, we've made the cursory search of the, uh, the entire contents of the house. We've now come out into the garden where we're sectioning off. And then we should make a far more detailed examination. When I first got to the bungalow, I felt nothing. I didn't get the feel of murder. There was no evidence. It was going to be a sticky one. No body, no pathology. Scenes of crime hadn't come up with much. As far as I knew, the interviews weren't producing anything. And I felt then that it was a case for the laboratory. We needed the scientists to run alongside us. And that, to me, was the next move. I knew before I started that the police had searched the premises several times and found nothing to indicate that a crime had been committed. There was a theory that Joey had disposed of his mother using acid. I considered this very unlikely myself, but I had a look in the bathroom and found that uh, a shower curtain surrounding the bath showed no signs of acid damage whatsoever and the chrome on the bath plug, again, showed no sign of acid damage at all. 
To be absolutely certain that no acids had been used, it was necessary to examine the drain leading from the house. I remember one voice behind me saying, bloody hell, he's turned her into a frog. Actually, the presence of the frog was of great value because it indicated that no noxious fluids had been down the drain for some considerable time because obviously the frog would have died. Any small spots and smears uh, would need detailed examination. So it's a question of getting down on hands and knees and having a very thorough look. To establish which of the stains, if any, were blood, required a chemical test. Uh, a positive result is a blue colour reaction. A label next to it, and we'll get some swabs. We knew that Joey carried out experiments on chickens in that room, so we were assuming that most of the blood would, in fact, be chicken blood. Yeah. What did you do with the chickens? Um, um, there was something wrong with the chicken feed, so. It made their eggs taste funny, so I killed them. How did you kill them? Well, some of them I chopped their heads off, but I didn't like that way of killing them because they jumped around with their heads off. It made a terrible mess in the kitchen and in the hallway. And so I killed the rest with ether. And what did you do with the dead chickens? Threw them away. Where? Um, in the garbage. In the workshop, there were numerous tools. Uh, these were examined for the presence of blood, and with one exception, were all negative. Because the hacksaw gave a positive reaction for blood, it was taken back to the laboratory for further examination. I want you to tell me something about your relationship with your parents. What do you mean? Well, how do you get on with your mother? I like my mother. You like your mother? Do you love your mother? Mm -hmm. I love my mother. Do you kiss your mother often, Joe? Kiss your mother often. Um, no, I don't kiss my mother. Why is this important? Do you ever kiss your mother? Do you ever kiss your mother? Why is this important? It's important because I'm trying to find out the relationship that you have with your mother. When did you last see your father? Um, um, about three weeks ago. Where was that? In Paris. He lives in Paris.
Hello? He's not... Who is this, please? No, he's... he's just disappeared. We've been making inquiries in France. I understand that your father went missing. Did you report him missing, Jay? I do not consider he is missing. Don't you think it's strange that you go to France to visit your father, and two days after you, you arrive, he walks out of the flat and doesn't come back? I do not think it is strange. Well, I think it's strange. And I think it's very strange that after you come back to England, your mother visits you, and then she goes missing. But you don't think that's strange? Uh, um, I do not consider her missing either. He was very frustrating to interview. He gave the impression that we were interfering with his world. Um, to talk to us was beneath him, really. And I was just hoping that forensic science would come up with something. Well, the samples of blood that we'd swabbed off, we examined to determine the species of origin. And in this particular case, all the samples we brought back proved to be human and not chicken. The blood was Group B. We knew that Joey was Group O, and from her blood donor record card, we knew that his mother was Group B. However, Group B blood occurs in about 11% of the population, so we could not say it was certainly his mother's blood. Just when we examined the hacksaw that the investigation took a sharp turn in events. several bits of tissue here. We've got this region which is fat and then further down we've got muscle tissue here and we've got connective tissue which is probably skin. We've had that hacksaw examined by the forensic scientists and in the tube of the hacksaw they found blood and human tissue and bone. How do you account for that? Um, I don't know how it got there. You do realise what I'm saying, do you? Yes. Do you think I'm lying? Do you think? Um, I think you're bluffing. I've read about police bluffing. It's part of their techniques. I can assure you, Joseph, that we're not bluffing. A more thorough search of the bungalow took many hours and at the end of that we'd found many more spots of blood. These were 
almost all on the floor or on the bottoms of the legs of furniture and radiated away from the center of the floor. And the fact that they're radiating into this corner must mean that the body was lying in this position here and that all the blood that originated from that has subsequently been cleaned up. Now, if people are cut severely, as you might expect if they're cut with a hacksaw, the major blood vessels of the body are severed and with blood pressure being present in a living person, the blood is squirted out in all sorts of directions. And this leads to blood splashing up walls and sometimes even onto a ceiling. In this case, as the blood only extended about nine inches from the floor, it was quite clear that the person must have been dead at the time they were bleeding. Someone had been dismembered in the bungalow and it obviously pointed to a murder. Joseph Silberman. You are charged that between the 5th and 10th of November 1981 at West Hope in the county of Hampshire, you murdered Lisa Silberman. That is contrary to common law. You are not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. Do you wish to say anything in answer to the charge? Um, I'm not guilty. At that stage, we could really only prove that he had dismembered the body of his dead mother. We were hoping for further evidence because at the end of the day, it may well have been that he would have been convicted of a lesser charge of concealing a dead body, which would carry, of course, a comparatively minor punishment. For example, if Jerry stood up in court and said that his mother had died of a heart attack or she had died by accident, but in panic, he had dismembered the body and disposed of it. There is a defence open to him to the charge of murder, and it was a gap that we needed to close. We were still very much out on the limb. We hadn't any direct evidence. What was the cause of death, we still didn't know. We didn't know it was Mrs Silverman. Where was the body? Where were we going to look? We had to get something more positive and the mind turned to the French connection and whether there could be an advantage in going over there. And therefore we decided that we would try and see what they could help us with in France. As soon as I entered the apartment, I had the feel for murder. There were blood spots on the ceiling around the light. There was a wall chart on which Leon had obviously recorded his daily weight. And the last entry for that was the 22nd of October, which was the day he was last seen. There was a typed letter which finished in the middle of a sentence. That also was dated the 22nd of October. But most important of all, there was a hacksaw in a pile of junk in the bedroom, a hacksaw similar to the one that we had found in the bungalow in Southampton. Someone bleeding very heavily had been dragged from the living room and into the bathroom. The room was very poorly lit, but using a good scenes of crime light, it was quite clear that blood was present on the bidet, along the skirting board, and all over the floor at the far end of the bathroom. We had probably two murder scenes. We had no bodies. There was the possibility of French evidence being available to us, but I did not know whether it would be admissible in the English courts. The whole inquiry now centred on find the mother's body. We knew he'd put his chickens in the garbage. Perhaps his mother had gone the same way. We called in body search dogs and searched all the areas where Joey was known to have walked. We also called in divers to search every local stretch of water. Again, they found nothing. We combed the countryside for months. We found absolutely nothing. The trial was approaching. The problem was, would we be able to prove murder without a body? Six weeks before the trial, we finally got a break. A dismembered body had been found in the country, 100 miles from Paris. We asked that Mike Sace be allowed to go over there straight away and conduct an examination.
we had the majority of a human being. The absence of the head and also the absence of the hands made identification very difficult. So it's difficult to measure, but no, we can do it because it's a nice cut. The height of the man was determined by the length of the long bone. It's, uh, the, it's a good way uh, to, to do that, and it's very old-fashioned, but still working very well. So it's 432 millimeters. Looking on the tables we have, it was possible to say that the height was between 162 and 168 centimeters. So you see the sternum and the ribs, yes. and there are calcification, big calcification going from the bone to the cartilage. Looking at the ribs, it's uh, easy to find deposits of calcium on the cartilage and bony formation which comes uh, with the years uh, going on. And this was possible to estimate the age between 60, 65. Uh, it's not a very, very accurate method, but it gives good results. We tried also to have the blood group of the subject. Even without blood, it was done on tissue and muscle by absorption, and we determined that it was B, the group B. I am B plus. I am 168, a little bit taller than 165, but it could be me. Uh, so uh, we have to find something else. And to see if the hacksaw could have been used to cut the bone, we took a piece of wax. We have cut the wax with the, the hacksaw and uh, putting some black powder on it to see the marks of the different teeth of the saw. We compared the marks of the teeth between the wax and the bone. And it was possible that the bone was cut by this uh, hacksaw. But most damning of all for Joey was the label still on one of the plastic bin liners. Joey had bought them only a few doors away from the travel agent where he bought his cross-channel ticket. Towards the end of the inquiry, when we'd taken the house apart in a search for the crutches and they'd still not turned up, we began lifting the lathe and tucked in under the bed of the lathe was a small piece of sheet steel which, when I lifted it up and cleaned it, it, bared, it was bearing the name of Zimmer, which is a crutch manufacturer. And then we realised that the crutches had in fact been here all the time and that he'd in fact put them in the lathe and turned them down to dispose of them. At the trial, the judge ruled that the French evidence was admissible as it related to Joey's frame of mind. He was found guilty of the murder of his mother. Her body was never found. Next week, indelible evidence provided by an apple leads to the conviction of an IRA terrorist. Next Friday at 9.